Ladies! I know, yeah, surprised to see me, considering you left me for dead. There'll be some changes oh my, so many things. I mean, the time period, the characters, I mean, having a show with so many female characters that have points of view and yeah. wants and needs and, oh my gosh, the story. I guess you would call it, yeah, the story yeah. is incredible. Yeah. And it's, uh, I guess, a comedy drama. Mm -hmm. Is that, the, the, you know, there there are very serious, heavy moments in it. And then things that are absolutely hysterically funny. And on my part, uh, when I was presented with the opportunity to be in this show, when I heard who was in it, Kristen Wiig, I mean, my God, and Allison Janney and Laura Dern and Ricky Martin, I mean, I could go on and on. I really didn't have to read the script. I said yes, because of the people I would be working with. And then, you know, the, the icing on the cake was the script itself. And the look of it is so gorgeous. The costumes and the scenery, and it's it's one of the most elaborate uh, things I, I've ever been involved in. And it's it's eye candy. It's beautiful to look at. The book is such a beautiful, complex look at um, at women at a particular time in the United States. That was a bit of a powder keg moment, and the idea of assembling all of them together to sort of see what happens next uh, in a world that Abe Sylvia could build out was a really de delicious idea. And we initially developed it with um, Laura in mind as the lead. As her producing partner, I tend to look at a lot of material with her in mind. Um, but you know, with scheduling conflicts and COVID and uh, any number of other things coming into play, that wasn't possible, so then we were able to expand that look for other actresses, and then adding Allison Janney, adding Kristen Wiig, a young unknown actress named Carol Burnett. Who in, I hear is very good. I've yeah. heard she's great. <laughs> um, it just offered everything, um, so it was too incredible to pass up. You know, I mean, Jamie put it perfectly. I would just add that while we're in this bubble, which often any club is a bubble that we want to belong to and we so want to be part of it and look like them and be accepted in a group, we forget what's happening around that group. And so 1969 was a perfect time to focus on this space that particularly Maxine, but all these women were clinging to, to feel valued, while the rest of the world was surrounding them, begging them to participate in what the world needed of them, uh, happening particularly in American politics at that time. So it was really exciting that in our producing of it, we also, with Abe, figured out a way that I could still be part of the show and come up with this character that speak to the antithesis of what these women represented, what else was happening in a, in a space of longing and belonging uh, to, to a movement, not a group. Um, and that was really, really fun to explore. And as producers get to find our amazing collaborators in our production designer, John Carlos, in Alex uh, Friedberg, yes. our costume designer, and Karen Bartek, who designed the wigs. It was yeah. uh, just a treat to to play with all of those creative people who um, were really, really the elite of what they do. I had only been in Palm Beach two weeks, but I already knew the Palm Royale, the most exclusive club in the world, was where I belonged. Um, well, I got the, the audition in my email like any normal actor. Uh, I did a self-tape, and after I submitted the tape, my agent called me about a week or two later and told me that Tate Taylor, who directed the pilot, and Abe, who, 
who wrote the show wanted to meet with me. And so I was immediately nervous. And he was like, there's no pressure. They don't want you to come in with any material. They don't want you to memorize. They just want to talk to you. So I was like, oh, I could do that. Um, so I went in and we just talked about food and recipes and the South, because we're all from the South. And it was just a bonding experience. And it was really relaxing, surprisingly. And then after that, about a week or two later, I, I had heard that I got the job, which is exciting. <laughs> Well, you know, it's weird. I didn't audition. And the reason why I didn't audition was kind of miraculous was because basically my sister-in-law is the costume designer of this show. And another friend of mine works very, very closely with Kristen Wiig. And so they both at the same time had said, hey, you should think about Josh for the part of Douglas. And because I was just starting to work on Yellowstone, I was in a situation where I couldn't really deal with, I couldn't, I couldn't. And so they were like, well, would he want to do it? Because, you know, if you remember in the beginning of the show, Douglas is kind of a very, you know, small part and that I didn't even know where it was going to go. And so to me, it, anyway, it was, but, but I also was like, are you kidding me? I would do that job for free, you know, <laughs> like the, the, the people involved, the material, everything about it was so heightened. Um, and I am such a massive fan of Kristen that I, I'm in so in love with what she does comically, comedically. But what I think makes her unusual is that she's such a deep actor that there's such, um, nuance and like heartbreak and pathos and all the characters that she plays, even when she's been incredibly funny. And so I, I jumped at the opportunity, truly. I just was like, absolutely, 100%. What was weird though, is I had to, you know, I was doing Yellowstone. So I was working on Palm Royale all week. And on Friday night, I would leave, I'd fly to Montana. I'd slap on this, uh, uh, you know, mustache and, and put on my Kevin Costner growl and become, you know, that character. And that world is so different, obviously. So it was a bit of a bipolar manic period to say the least. I got spray tanned. <laughs> that was my biggest rep. <laughs> um, gosh, how, I don't know. I mean, it's, we just, I, for me, I worked with, Abe a lot and and Laura to be honest because she had this this book and the project for such a long time and I wanted to make Maxine something different than I had done before um, and I don't know I just I think also when you start trying on the clothes and the hair and you start seeing the world something just kind of clicks. Lots of times I when I was doing my variety show. I didn't know how I was going to do a character until I got into the clothes yeah. and into the wig, into the shoes, you know, and then all of a sudden, it's like little kids and uh, Halloween, you put a little boy like or a little girl in a cowboy outfit, they become cowboys, yeah. they, they become fairy princesses once they see what they look like. So I, that's, that's, so that's the way I felt, you know, whenever I, I do anything. Of course, I didn't have to do much the first few episodes because I'm in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> so all I had to do was lie there and keep my eyes closed. <laughs> well, for me, it was, to me, this is a very specific time for people, for African-American people. And so 1969, I just did a lot of research on the Black Panthers and activists at that time, like uh, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, um, Kathleen Cleaver, to see exactly what their mindset was. What were they fighting for? And I knew it would be different for me because I'm in Palm Beach, but I'm still in the South. Um, and you're in an environment that doesn't literally, it doesn't necessarily look like you. Like there's not a lot of people that look like me in Palm Beach at this time. So trying to figure out what what Virginia might have been grappling with by being a fish out of water um, in this environment was what started the journey for me. You're a grasshopper. Oh, you found the cream to cacao after all. We sent someone out for it. Well, that is what I call going above and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait, don't you need me to uh, sign for it? Excuse me? Did I spill? In a manner. You know, it's incredible. What's even more amazing 
is for Jamie and I as producers to watch the work of these masters in costume and makeup and hair. So for me, with Alex, the costume designer, I had worked with her on a show Enlightened, on Big Little Lies, she's the best. But to watch how she created all these characters and to be deeply involved, not just myself with amazing Frida and Simone who helped me design the look of this character of Linda, but then watch the work of everyone for all these characters to come alive that we'd been developing over four or five years was just amazing. Amazing experience, really fun. Oh man, we had like, because my sister was the costume designer, the the authenticity, like the way that they were using these incredible, these, these, you know, true vintage pieces from the 1960s that were so beautiful, the fabrics and all of it. I mean, you felt like the depth that, honestly, the commitment that Apple had to the show because they were pouring so much into it. They were allowing so much authenticity. But the main thing was every day, in a weird way, this was a very intimidating job because you're going to work with this very complicated material. You know, hopefully it just seems very light and fun and funny, but there's so many nuances going on, right, underneath it. And you had comedy geniuses around you. And I don't use that word. I mean, Carol Burnett is clearly a, a, a level of greatness that I've really never come across before. And so you felt every day that if you were not bringing your absolute best work, you were going to get bowled over. Um, and it was exciting in that way. It was very, very, very... Um, kind of joyfully challenging. It was very exciting because I love fashion. So to be able to see the difference between what we were wearing, which is earth tones, which are browns and, and deep burgundies compared to the high society women with their pastels and their bright colors. And I was a little jealous because I was like, oh my God, the colors. But it was so exciting to see the difference between the two. The set was amazing. There were parts like, I remember having a number two pencil from 1969. There was stuff that that really took you back into that time. Things that people will never ever see. Little small details that really helped immerse us in the time. Oh my God. Well, I kind of think the, the final event that's in the show was, I think both of those things, the most challenging. And I just remember walking on that set and yeah. I mean, we were actually shooting at it on a different stage while they were building it. And we would constantly like take little golf carts over there and like, oh my gosh, have you seen it now? Have you seen it now? We would go over and just be like, I, I couldn't believe they built that whole thing. And yeah. not a lot of time. It was just, it blew my mind. And, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. I think, I don't want to give it away. That's my problem. Yeah. Yeah. You That's know, okay. there was, yeah. <laughs> Something you know? towards the end. <laughs> Yeah, I get. I I don't know. I I never felt very challenged. I was just having fun. So I I don't. I can't think of a more a challenging day or a scene. Maybe when I started to come out of the coma, because I had to figure out a way to try to talk but not make any sense. So, but that was not just one day. That was a lot of days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know we're both going to say, which we won't give anything away, but the idea of a party that might happen towards the end to walk on set and, and see what they create To be blown away again by John Carlos and Alex Friedberg because they built by hand the most spectacular display. <laughs> I've ever witnessed with human eyes. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. And we won't give it away, but watch. And <laughs> and what's incredible, because it's in our finale, is also you, it's a perfect embodiment of how absurd it is that that's what people long for. It's, it, it's like, you know, on steroids, the, the like absurdity of proving wealth and grandness, like beyond compare. And do any of us need any of it? And so one it, moment tops the next. Yeah. It's like a wedding cake. And at the top there are sparklers and then the cake explodes. Yeah. 
I think the most exciting day on set had to be the day we shot the beach ball, which was one of our last days of shooting because there were so many elements. There was so much back, so many background actors on set that day and the costumes and the set, it was so grand. The colors, there was just, it was so rich. There were, everywhere you turned, it was something new. Like I couldn't, my eyes were full. I couldn't take in enough. Um, so just being able to like, kind of merge the worlds because I think that was the first time that the bookstore crew and like the high society people were kind of in the same environment. So to be in this environment, it was exciting. It was thrilling. <laughs> um, and one of the most challenging, I think, days on set was I came to set and they told me I had to literally run, like run in a scene. And I was like, oh, I wish I would have told me because I would have been running for a week so I could be prepared, you know. But <laughs> I pulled it off, ran across that grass at least six or seven, eight or nine times. Um, and I did it. You know, I was like, okay, I can do this. Okay, Marvel, where you at? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was exciting. There was a day where we were doing the golf scenes and, you know, that the character, he, he, uh, Douglas is so drunk. <laughs> You know, he's so drunk and he's being so terrible to Robert, Ricky Martin's character, because he doesn't even know his name, you know, <laughs> like, and he's just, a, he's like, to, to, but it was so much fun to play as we were like, you know, scheming and coming up with stuff and like being on top of the world and being drunk and just being like, I have always seen Douglas like a, like a puppy dog, like a, like a stupid puppy dog that's just ripping up a house and has no idea that he's doing it. Um, but the, I don't say the worst day, but the days that were kind of hardest where you know, the big scenes with Kristen where he's, you know, he's, he's, he's broken her heart, you know? And I like, I would look in her eyes and I would feel so, and, and the big complicated dialogue that was going along with it is Douglas is trying to like wiggle his way out of whatever problem he's created. And I just, I, I definitely had moments where I, I felt like, you know, just to get the tone right from the comedy to the heartbreak, to the truthfulness, but also the, the kind of stupidness of Douglas. <laughs> like I definitely had moments where I was like, oh, wow, this is really difficult in a, in a really fun way. Palm Beach is just a shell game. Everybody has a secret. You two behave. You don't have to have money. The blackmail is right here. You don't know the half of it. What in the fires of hell's pits is going on here? Off we go. You ran over your head. My girl, you don't even know it. I am never in over my head. It would be disrespectful to my hairdresser. Touche. In Palm Beach, my secret is like a loaded gun. No, 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 no. You never know when it will go off. Or who it might hit. Ladies! I know, yeah, surprised to see me, considering you left me for dead. There be some chance. 